Could you tell me when and where you were born? Chihuahua, Mexico, in 1943. And uh, that's the northern part of Mexico, which is the closest, actually, to the U.S. Okay, good. And is that where you grew up? Part of the time I grew up in Chihuahua, and a lot of my summers I spent there. Uh, the rest of the time, I grew up in Mexicali, which is right on the border with Calexico. And uh, I was remembering this uh, morning when I woke up very early at around five in the morning that um, actually I spoke English very early on because my parents would send me to school in the U.S. I had to cross the border every morning to go to Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic School, you know, since I was in the third grade. Wow. Why, why did they do that? Was, was it a better school? Was it it's a be well, it was considered a better school because once you live in the border, you know, you see the north as something that is better than the south. Mm -hmm. So Mexicans have, to this day, send their children across the border, you know, to mm -hmm. school. And then you moved, your family left Mexico. Then, and at around age 13, uh, my father was an administrator of a newspaper in the border. It was called the ABC. And my father, uh, originally, when he started working, when he was first married, he was a linotype operator. And a linotype operator is kind of like a, uh, it was a technical wonder to have a linotype. I don't know if you know what a linotype is. I do not. That was uh, originally um, all type before it was printed, was separated, each letter, each space, each period, and you had to set it in these things. So they invented the linotype, which created lines of type, leaded type, and they could be put together and printed. So it was like a novelty. It was a big thing, you know. But he had left that and become an administrator, and a friend of his in Los Angeles offered him a job as a linotype operator. But he said, life is way better in the United States, and it would be better for you and your children. And my father, you know, proceeded to get all our papers in order, and we, you know, immigrated what was to that? L.A. To L.A. What was that like for you as a 13-year-old? It was like a tragedy. You know, it was awful. It was very, very hard. It was... Uh, yeah, I think it um, it created me. It made me who I am today, you know, that move, because it was so painful. Um, we moved to a place, from a place where you're cherished and where your culture is cherished and where you're um, uh, yourself, you're an integral person, to a place where you're... Uh, you feel that somebody wants to destroy you hmm. or you know you're not wanted you're you're the unwanted really and that's where i feel that it created kind of my social consciousness you know fortunately i was 13 i wasn't younger because i think it would have really wounded me more than it did you know to have moved um <clears throat> moving from mexico to uh, the United States, to uh, a suburb in L.A. It was hard, yeah. you know, because uh, it was mostly white people, and uh, we were the, um, the Mexicans in the block. So you can imagine that. I mean... Yeah. Do you have siblings? I have siblings. Yes, I how, do. How, what's the age difference and how many of you are there? Uh, there's five of, five of us and I'm the eldest. Okay. Yeah. Did it affect your siblings differently than you? Yeah, so it was different for them because they could, they really became involved in the Chicano movement. You see, it was, it was a civil rights and then the Chicano movement and then there was a fight, you know, for some kind of, uh, you know, demand of respect. And uh, by that time, you know, I was m older, so that I had kind of jumped that experience. What were you, where were you at? Where was in, I at? In your experience, yeah, what was it, like if they were, um, 
Where did, well, you, well, where had, did you focus your, your I, angst and your energy? <laughs> I had my own little teeny Chicano movement going on inside of myself. You know, like uh, it, it became for me, like my reason for being, as they say in French, but I won't say it in French, I'll say it in English, you know, right? It, it was my reason for living, for being, and for becoming, you know, who I've become, you know, and to struggle and to do things that are going to represent our humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that was my purpose, you know. Did you um, keep in touch with friends from, from Mexico? Mexico, it was very hard. It was very hard. Mm -hmm. It was very painful not to have them. Yeah. You know, very painful. But um, slowly, you know, slowly I, you know, attained other friends and learned other things. And at the same time that it was painful, it, then it became a little bit exciting because it was also my teenage years, you know. So I met a lot of different people. And Los Angeles uh, actually was very helpful in that way because once I, you start driving and you start traveling to Hollywood, and then you realize that there is this, this whole other life right, that is available to you. So in a certain way, I kind of buried my, deep in myself, you know, my pain, and then it became my force, mm -hmm. just like Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, what was it like for your mother? Oh, my mother, I am sure it was very, very hard for my mother, it was difficult. My mother had lived a different life. I'm, in Mexico, we had somebody that would help with the children and with the house, and my mother came to be the sole housekeeper and uh, cook and everything for uh, five children. So, and also to be away from her family, to be away from her friends, you know? So it, it was, this, these, these are the realities of immigrants. What would you say are the um, the most uh, prevalent qualities that you inherited from your parents? Like, how would you describe them, and, and what part of them do you see in yourself? I think uh, um, some kind of tenacity. I think uh, humor from both of my parents. They were both very funny. You know, and I admire that in them, and also their love, you know, for their family. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of interests and hobbies and things did you have at that age, and like in the after you came to Los Angeles? I always had a, the hobby of photography when I was uh, younger. My father had given me a little camera, and uh, when I was going to grammar school, you know, I won a contest of you know, photography contest. And I was always very uh, enamored of that. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Did you have any idea what you wanted to be when you grew up? I, I don't think I knew what I wanted to be. I remember graduating from high school and going to the counselor's office. I went to Catholic high school. And uh, going to the counselor, and I wasn't a great student. And I think partly because I had to adapt. Partly, but also I'm dyslexic, so I had, you know, that problem. But at the same time, I'm very personable, and, you know, I really got along with people very well. And when I went to the counselor, I, I wanted, you know, I wanted to go to college, and I remember the counselor saying to me, uh, you know, I think you should study to be a secretary. I think you'd be very good at it. And I said, oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think I would be very good at it at all, which is true. I would be terrible, you know, and what a terrible idea. So I thought, but if she's the counselor and this is what she thinks I should be, you know, I wonder what I should be. So it yeah. was not clear. Um, <clears throat> Before we get into when it did become clear, <laughs> yeah. Before we get into that, I yeah. want to talk a little bit more about just like the childhood and yeah. And I mean, you mentioned that the, what the neighborhood was like—a su suburban and very white. What else can you tell me in sort of painting a picture of that neighborhood where you live? A very isolated, very far away from any central um, streets. You know, the way I was used to living. 
um, not a lot of life around, you know, because they were new um, track homes. Oh, oh, that's where, what happened. Where was it? La Puente, you know, and it was what happened at that time when we moved there in the late 50s, there used to be fields of flowers and they created um, tracks of homes. My mother had managed to save enough money so that we, in Mexico, um, and she brought it. And with that money, we did a down, actually I bought the house because they didn't speak English. So I, I had to go buy the house, you know, and, and we have it to this day, this house in La Puente. Wow. And so, uh, so it was very isolating, you know, and, Strange. What is, what is it like as a child to take on such a responsibility? I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're buying the house, but your parents are buying the house, but because you speak the language and they don't. What is that like? Well, it's like normal. <laughs> it's normal because you have to do it. I had to put my, my brothers and sisters in school. You know, I had to, you know, I had to take on a lot of responsibility because I spoke English. I mean, not very well, but more than anybody else. More than your brothers and sisters? Exactly, right. Okay. So I had to do all those things. And I think that made me uh, a very um, in charge kind of person and eventually very bossy and people don't like that part of me. <laughs> but it came in handy in my profession. I'm sure it did. <laughs> <laughs> did your parents have any plans or, or hopes, expectations for what you would do when you grew up? Let's see. Or when you graduated from high school? Well, yeah, I think I, my father wanted me to be a journalist. That was his dream, you know? But he also wanted me to swim the English Channel, <laughs> you know? I, my father always had big dreams for me. He, because he worked in the newspaper, he always brought me newspapers and books and things. And then one time, I remember he brought a newspaper and there was this woman who had crossed the English Channel and she was filled with, I think, I don't know if it was whale fat or what, you know, and it was very dark, a very dark picture. And he said, look at this woman. She crossed the English Channel. You're a great, I actually was a very good swimmer. And he said, you can do the same. <laughs> Did you ever have any desire to do such a thing? No, I'm afraid of sharks. I like to swim in pools. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm with you on that. Okay. What about um, uh, movies when you were a kid? Did you go to the movies very yes. often? You did? Yes, yes, yes. I went to the movies a lot. In Mexico, the movies, and to Mexican people, the movies are, you know, a great entertainment. And ever since I was very young, I went to the movies. And I lived like uh, one block away from a theater. So I have great memories of going to the to the movies with my cousins. Yeah. And then what about when you moved to L.A.? It was different. The cinema was much further. Um, my father had to take us, drive us, and, and then come back and pick us up. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as accessible. That's sort of the, the isolated. Yes, it was the it. isolated thing. And also television was much more present in Los Angeles, so we watched a lot of television. And I remember that my English was not so good, so I would, we would watch like the Mickey Mouse Club and I would try to pronounce the way that they were pronouncing in the television. That helped me hmm. with my pronunciation. Yeah. Do you remember the first movie you ever saw? I do. I think it was a Errol Flynn movie. No, no, I'm sorry. That's not, that's the one that I remember because I, I loved the shot from the mask down, you know, but I didn't know that I loved the shot from the mask down, but I loved the idea that you could look down at the pirate ship, right? Um, I saw actually Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. yeah. And my, an uncle of, a, of ours took us to see all the Charlie Chaplin films. That's great. Yeah. Did you have any, any inkling that you might go into film? Well, that was something that was so uh, not, ex not, not in my dreams, not in my consciousness. I don't know. I didn't know how you could make a film. I didn't understand, you know, but I loved them. Did you have, what was your sense of Hollywood at that time? Or not even Mexico Hollywood. 
Mm. I wasn't thinking of Hollywood. I mean, I didn't realize that all the movies were made in Hollywood until later, later, much later. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was like out of uh, high school, then it all became clear. Right. So tell me a little about what you did after high school. After high school, I, I went to college, but I started seeing, um, meeting people that were from Hollywood. You know, I started meeting people that lived in Hollywood, young, young kids. And um, I had a friend whose father was a screenwriter. And uh, I was going to college, and she said to me, why don't you come and help me in my film? And I said, I don't know what, I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do, what, I don't know how I can help you. And she said, oh, you can, just come. And she was making a film, a documentary film for Britannica Films. Her name was Sally Loeb. And um, she made a film about a little blind boy. And I remember the, the whole crew was from UCLA. They were all film students. And I was the only one that wasn't. And I was like the, um, just a PA, you know, but, I, you know, just trying to help out. And everybody's working, it's all exciting. And it, to me, it was like wonderful to finally see how this thing is made, how the mechanical, you know, actions make a film. And, uh, and I took to it immediately. And I remember working very hard and the producer with this wonderful old guy, he wasn't old, I mean, he was half my age, but I remember he came you know, and I was very enthusiastic in everything that I did, and I helped everyone. And he said, you know what? You're the only one who knows what they're doing, all these kids. <sighs> <laughs> wow. And I thought, you know, that's so profound for a kid. You're the only one who knows what they're doing. And I thought, really? All right. <laughs> you know, so this is for me. This is something that I really love. And I understood film. I, I Intuitively, I understood. When I went to college, I went to junior college. It was called Mount Sac, which is close to uh, La Puente. That's where I began. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, so then that seems to be when you're kind of fascination and, and under like real understanding for film was born then? Exactly, right, right. And at the same time, I liked my art classes more than I liked the other classes. And I remember, um, you know, taking theater and writing something for theater that, you know, was very successful. And I knew that I had some kind of facility for all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what did you do next? Well... You know, I just kept um, trying to get jobs to do that, but I was going to school as well. And then I had to work, and I kind of dropped everything. And I worked as a dental assistant while I was going to school, and I couldn't pursue film, you know how that is. And, and then I got married, you know, to a young dentist that I was working with in this clinic, and uh, I kind of dropped filmmaking mm -hmm. and we decided to come and move uh, to San Francisco and when we moved to San Francisco and then I started having children and one thing led to the other and there was just no time as most mothers know you know to pursue anything else but I loved poetry and I loved the art scene in San Francisco and that was very inspiring for me very mm -hmm. very inspiring and poetry most of all you know, and the art and everything that was happening in the 70s. So give me a little bit of time reference. So you, at what, around what year did you get married? Yeah, I got married in 69. Okay, and yeah. then you moved to San Francisco when? When, in uh, 72, 70, something around there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th there was this wonderful... Um, kind of community of artists here at that time. It was very bohemian and very romantic and very, you know, uh, 
I, I don't know, very inspiring. So I met one person, another person, and I met this woman called Nina Serrano. And Nina um, had, was married to Saul Landau. Saul Landau was a documentary filmmaker and also a filmmaker, and they had just recently made a film in Chile called Que Hacer. Nina's a poet and a writer, and she's still alive and wonderful person. And she was the one that, you know, when we were engaged in this group called Third World Communications, it was the first time that a lot of people of color, different color, different races, got together and organized and wrote books and poetry. And, and Nina said, let's make a film. Because I've made a film before. You know, Nina had with her husband. And uh, let's propose something to the American Film Institute. And I said, really? She said, yes, yes, you're an artist. And I said, I am? <laughs> and that's how we started, you know, making the first film that we made, which was uh, after the earthquake. Right. Yeah. And that was uh, fiction, right? Yeah. OK. Did you write the script? Did you write we, it together? Yes, like we wrote it together. We wrote the script together. And we directed it together, you know, and we edited it together. And, uh, you know, we did everything together. But I felt really like this was it. This was what I was going to do. That's so great. Yeah. <laughs> and I was pregnant. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. With which child? With the third child. Yeah, that's 34 years old now. Okay. Yeah. And there's pictures of me with Chris Samuelson, who was a sound woman, uh, you know, your professor. Um, and we both had these big bellies. She's got the, all her sound gear. <laughs> That's dedication. Yeah, it was love. Yeah. That's what it was. You know, it was a love of a, a profession, a love of an expression. And I saw that. You know, making this film because we wanted to make a film about the community, the Nicaraguan community, about the Latino community, because those were the deepest concerns that came forth again here in San Francisco through art, you know, uh, of social justice, you know, in, um, in art. Mm -hmm. And Nina was the, really the midwife of that. Mm -hmm. And did, did you feel like you were kind of, you know, finding your voice for the first time, or? I, I felt, yeah, definitely that I, uh, I felt like I had a voice and that it was worth expressing. I, right after, um, after the earthquake, you know, I was actually taking some classes at the San Francisco Art Institute. You know, just one class here and there because I had three boys, three children. And uh, then I met um, Susana Munoz, Susana Blaustein, really. That was her name then. And uh, I remember I was editing, editing a film in the uh, editing room, and she came by, and it was a tango, and she was from Argentina. And she said, wow, you know a tango and this and that? And I said, yes, yes. And she said, why don't we make a film? <laughs> I said, really? Yeah, let's make a film. I'll tell you a story. And she told me the story about the women of Plaza de Mayo. She told me the story of the dictatorship in Argentina. And this was the first time that I really had a lot of knowledge about what was happening in South America. And it was here in San Francisco that enabled me to really engage in, in those social movements in, in Latin America, you know, and in Brazil and in Argentina, everywhere, you know. What was it about San Francisco that enabled that? I think it's the the population at that time here, you know, and the openness. There wasn't just a focus on Chicano film like there was in Los Angeles. You know, this was about everywhere. Uh, we were, for example, I have friends that were very much engaged in the struggle for the I Hotel, the International Hotel. You're, I don't know if you know that, you're too young. Mm -hmm. But there was a hotel that was filled with men that had come from the Philippines and lived by themselves in this hotel because they were not allowed to marry. 
when they came as, as farm workers. And they were trying to destroy the I Hotel and get rid of these older men that had no one. So it became a cause, you know, for all of us also to make a film about that. So I'm just curious about what the, the transition from Los Angeles to San Francisco, was that very easy for you, that particular move? Yes, yeah. yes, it was. I was older, I was married, you know, and uh, I was going to a really exciting place. A really, really exciting place, you know, that had all this cultural life, that had, you know, uh, a history of bohemian life. So we're talking about how old you were when you really started making films. Yeah. Yeah, around uh, in my mid-30s, huh? I started with that film, but it was very, very hard because of the children. Mm. And it became like a problem between me and my husband. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Because the husband that I had was not really, I mean, he wanted to be supportive, but he couldn't be. It was too hard for him. Yeah. You know, he had just come from a different reality than mine. You know, it's like two people that are so different. At the beginning, they're not so different, but at the end, they're very different. Yeah. So I kind of, um, you know, kind of held back and started doing more like art films in the Art Institute, you know, scratching on film and <laughs> that kind of thing, which I love very much, but um, it wasn't as satisfying. Uh, so... Um, I continued with uh, uh, making the film Las Madres, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, Susana. And we started fundraising, and people were excited about it because this story had not been out. Nobody knew about Las Madres de Plaza de Mayo. Mm -hmm. I mean, and people in Argentina knew, but the world didn't know that these women had been looking for their disappeared children. And there was you know, I don't know, thousands and thousands of people disappeared. So um, it was a, a, an exciting moment to fundraise and to get enthusiasm around the film, and uh, we managed to do it. How long did you, did you film in Argentina? Uh, we, went, we were in Argentina three times. We couldn't really film during the dictatorship because we were in danger. You know, uh, the mothers didn't want us to do that because they knew, you know, something could happen to us. So we had to wait until Alfonsin came into power and the junta was gone. And that's when we began. But what we didn't understand was that, you know, at the same time that the junta was gone, the junta was still in power, really. So, I mean, we, we did suffer that somewhat, you know. Nothing happened to us, but things happened to our film. You know, things would happen to the mothers. Um, the first time that we went, we took, as you know, it wasn't video. It was 16 millimeter film. So we took a, a big, um, how do you call those things? Uh, uh, a trunk. A trunk. A trunk, but, you know, a film trunk filled with, filled with film. And what and we got a chain in a big lock so that it couldn't be opened. And lo and behold, that was the greatest thing that we did because at one point they came into our, our flat where we were living while we were filming and they were looking for something and they destroyed the whole house but they couldn't open this trunk and they couldn't lift it. <laughs> because it, it gets so big, you know, and bulky. And uh, were you there at the time that they came? Or were you no, out? no, 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 no. Well, what's interesting that I think about this film also is if you uh, keep in mind that we both went to the Art Institute. We're both making films that are not conventional films. They're not Hollywood films, and they're really not really documentaries as they were made in those days, you know, the early, the 80s, all right? So we both went, and Susanna is very intelligent, 
you know. And we both thought, how are we going to make this film? We've never learned how to make a documentary. Nobody has taught us how to make a documentary. How do you do it? So I had worked uh, for other people here in San Francisco in my enthusiasm for film in other documentaries. And I said, well, what we have to do is study it. That's what we have to do. We're going to get some films. We're going to get some documentary films. And we're going to see how they create them. And then we're just going to follow that pattern. <laughs> and that's what we did. We saw a few films. And we said, OK. I said, look, this is how you make it. You make it from this perspective, this point of view, or you get a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It was like a recipe. And that's how we made the film, from our own studies, not from any schooling that we got, right. which was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I consider that to be like something <laughs> that was that I always thought, wow, we just went and looked at the, looked it up, <laughs> you know, and did it. Did you find that at all daunting, or not really? No, not really. No, not really. Okay. You know. Did uh, did you and Susana um, talk ahead of time about how you were going to collaborate, or um... we did? Okay, so we did, and we like? said that we were going to co-direct, co-produce, co everything. Mm -hmm. Well, I we were successful in doing it, you know, in co-writing it, co-directing. You know, we said one day you, one day me. We didn't even choose subjects. We said just one. This day for you, this day for me. Really? Yeah, and you just take whatever, you know, and do it. I mean, we were just novices, really, so that's how we did it. So wait, you said you went three different times to yes. Um How long did you stay each time, or was it different? It, it was different, you know. We went to shoot twice. We went to scout once. You know, we fundraised a lot. We spent a lot of time fundraising. That was hard. Mm -hmm. How did you um, find and then approach the subjects, the mothers who you ended up uh, using in the film? Well, the mothers, originally, when the first time we went, we went to the, they had a house. And we went and interviewed them and talked to them. And then another time, Susana also went by herself because she was from Argentina, so she would go visit her parents. So that's how we determined what mothers we were going to uh, interview. So if they were the mothers that once we had our story of how we wanted to tell it, you know, we picked and chose, mm -hmm. you know, the mothers that were going to represent the story. So, and the film came out in, I guess, 86, right? Yeah, 85, 85, I think. Okay. The, the thing about the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo, which I've never encountered ever since that time, was that they were so valiant that they never were afraid. They were never afraid. They would talk about it everywhere. Really? They were brave like anything, and they were intelligent, and they were sharp, and they, they were amazing. They were a big, big uh, influence on me. You know, at that time in my life, they were, I can't, they were like warriors, geniuses. Yeah. You know, and they were warm and they were, they, we would go, like when we first went, and I remember we went to the Plaza de Mayo, and we were not filming, we were just observing to see what we were going to do. And supposedly the, the junta, was not in power anymore. And we were walking, and there was this man taking pictures of us, but close-ups. And uh, they knew that it was, you know, from the armed forces. And this little woman about this high went up to this guy, and she swung her purse and just whacked him in the face. And this, you know, this guy was a soldier, probably. Wow. You know? And uh, they were not afraid. They were not afraid. This was the most beautiful thing. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the, the power in that fearlessness. Because for years, clearly, they lived in fear and in silence. 
and they were not doing that anymore. They never lived in silence. They didn't? They never. They it's... always protested. That's the thing about Argentinian mothers. They, they will always protest. But it seemed like there was a time frame, and, you know, yes. perhaps I, I yeah. understood it wrong, that where when the, the child disappeared, and then when they finally sort of, the mothers Gathered. started to find each other. Yes. And I, I don't, I guess, you know, like, so that's what I'm referring to. I think it was kind of immediate. Okay. Because they started searching for their kids. Mm -hmm. And then when we asked them, you know, how can you be like this? You know, how can you be so brave? And they said, when you have lost everything, you have nothing left to lose. Wow. Yeah, that's a really, really powerful. Yeah, yeah. And heart wrenching. Yeah. Um, They're mostly dead now. Yeah. There's one left that I know, you know. Did you keep in touch with them? I did. We always kept in touch with them. Yes, we had, you know, uh, real relationships with them. They would visit us. You know, even just more recently, I was in Argentina about three or four years, three years ago, I believe, and I went to see, you know, the mother who's left. And uh, it was wonderful. It was just very great because I think every film that I have made, I have kept in touch with those people, and they've become a part of my life, mm. you know. They become my life, kind of, you know. And uh, that's what I love about documentary. You know, it's not, you never let go of them. Yeah. Is that, do you find that is common among your, your fellow documentary filmmakers, that they keep in touch with their subjects in the same degree that you have? I don't know. It depends. You know, some people just say no. You know, you, you go in there, get the story, and you got it, and, you know, move on. You know, but I'm a different person. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I can't move on. They become a, a part of me and I'm a part of them. Well, also these uh, topics are incredibly personal and you, you really seem to forge a pretty intense connection. Yes. Um, so that makes sense. But it does seem uh, not highly unusual, but I don't see that as the norm mm. or the most common. I don't know. But, yeah. Um, so. I mean, you suck their blood. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do. Yeah. You do, in a way. But in another way, you forge a relationship, and, and it creates you as a person, you know. Uh, these choices that if you're looking for justice, if whatever it is that you're thirsting for, you know. And, and I think that's what's driven my work, and also because, you know, it's become... Uh, a work of the heart more than a work of the mind or the or the work of money or anything like that. That has been my trajectory, and uh, it's enriched me. I hope, you know, and enriched everyone that I've worked with. I think. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you learned about filmmaking through making that film. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know everything. <laughs> Uh, I learned a lot. You know, I learned about camera work. I, I learned about people. I learned how to interview people. I learned about trying to get along with another producer, uh, director. You know, I, um, I learned about South America. I learned about editing. You know, everything. Everything. It was my, my schooling. Yeah. Las Madres. Was there, uh, were there challenges around um, editing choices? With yes. Yes. I work with, uh, we worked with uh, Irving Seraf, a wonderful filmmaker and uh, editor. And um, I think the, the greatest challenge was dealing with Susana. Mm -hmm. You know, we started having problems. Oh, really? You know, around choices. And uh, they were not so much the choices. I think the choices were already made. We, sh we shot the film so that there, wasn't, there weren't that many choices. But then egos started 
you know, all these things festering, like somebody has more power than the other. These are real problems that happen between two directors. And it was very naive on our part to think that we could make a film together, especially with two strong people and two intelligent people, you know, with a, a clear vision. But it wasn't that, you know, it was more like, like a recognition that suddenly, you know, there was this whole... Yeah. Um, conflict. Mm -hmm. How did you resolve those creative differences and conflicts? Uh, we did that same thing, like you work with the editor one day, I work with the editor the next day. I don't know how we made such a wonderful film <laughs> sometimes, you know, because sometimes it's so hard. Yeah, that's so sounds, hard. That sounds very yeah. challenging. Yeah. And did you find, I mean, you know, often you, you envision a certain film and you go out to shoot it and then you come back and you watch all your footage and you realize you have to sort of uh, re-visualize what you're making, depending on what you got. Did that happen at all with this film? Or No. Okay. No, no. Okay. And actually, it hasn't happened to me. Oh, really? That's yeah, nice. except for one film, for one film that was very experimental, but that's way into the future from Las Madres, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Okay. But um, I think the, the plan has kind of always fulfilled itself. It was always accessible. There was always a way to work with it. There was a, always a way to edit it. And, you know, it, it was, uh, I'm lucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. What about, um, how was it getting it um, screened? Did you show it theatrically? Did it show yes. on public you know, television? Like what were the yes. venues? Yes. Um, Las Madres was uh, shown theatrically and it had like an incredible response. Uh, everywhere it showed, uh, it had an incredible response because it also it was the first time that people had heard about it. And it was very stunning and very, it, it's a very moving film. And I think a lot to the credit of Irving Seraf too, because he was such a great editor, yeah. you know, of putting all that, all those elements together and creating all this. I mean, it was emotional as it was, but I think it was crafted in that way. Um, it traveled all over the world, that film, everywhere. You know, and it brought the news of what was happening in Argentina. And it received, I don't know, you know, dozens of prizes all over. And it was nominated for an Academy Award. That's what I was going to say yeah. next. Yeah. Yeah. How did that, how did that make you feel? <laughs> shocked. Really? Shocked. It was shocking. You know, we thought, wow, you know, our first documentary <laughs> we scored. Yeah, it was shocking, and it was wonderful. It was great, you know, yeah. to have that recognition. Great. Did you get any kind of official response or unofficial response from the Argentinian government or anything? Was there any kind of... No, they, they would never respond. Of course, they're too arrogant. But I think the, the response, when it was showed at the, um, at the uh, Cultural Center, San Martin, in Buenos Aires... There was a line of about, probably like about six blocks of people trying to see the film, you know? So it was, it spoke to them for the first time. A film came forth and said it the way that they had been hearing it from the mothers. Right. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Great work. Yeah. No, it is a wonderful film. To this day, it's very touching to me. Mm -hmm. And then your next film, you collaborated with Susana again. Not entirely. Not entirely? Okay. Not entirely. We started the film together. Tell me which film. It's called La Ofrenda, and it's about the Days of the Dead. And uh, we, you know, we decided we were going to continue to work together, but I saw the whole thing going south. You know, it didn't seem like it was going to work, but... I said, look, Las Madres, this is another thing that happens with these very, very um, poignant films is that it, they take an emotional, an emotional toll on you. 
on your person, you know, your whole body, everything. It just, you suffer with them and you become a part of that. And it's, a lot of it is suffering. And um, I said, look, we got to make another film. Let's make a film about, everybody is also egging us on to make another film. Because once you get nominated, you don't know, you got to keep on producing, right? So um, I said, let's make a documentary about the Days of the Dead. The Days of the Dead were beginning to be um, celebrated here in the mission. You know, uh, Ralph Maradiaga started these celebrations at that time. And I said, let's do it because, you know, it's so important. And it's another way of looking at death that is not as painful. And she was not... You know, Susana was not that excited about it, but it was easy to get the money. It, you know, we could do the research, all that. Was it easy to get the money because of the Oscar nomination? Of course. Yes, yes. It was, once you get an Oscar nomination, of course, you know, many doors open for you. You know, it's much easier to to have a career. And um, so we. it was easy to do in a way, but she didn't really want to do it. So we did the research, we did some shoots together, and after that, she quit. Yeah. So then I had to take it all on and, and try to craft it and finish it up. And was that something, I mean, did you enjoy that? or did Oh, you, yes. You did? Yes, okay. I loved it. But also, since we had kind of thought of it, conceived it together, she was gone, and uh, I'm left with all the work to do, right? And this is the first time I work with Vivian Hillgrove, you know, this wonderful um, editor, an amazing person, an amazing, uh, amazingly gifted editor. And you've worked with her on most Everything. every film, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you two meet? There. Um, we met at uh, when they were doing the right stuff, you know, with Phil Kaufman here in San Francisco. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So that's how somebody said, no, get Vivian to, to help you edit. She's a great editor. And I said, okay. But she was at this time, she, I think, you know, she was working on features. And she was sick of working on features. And she said, well, I'm going to try to work in documentary because it's earthier. It's more me, you know. And lo and behold, we started working. It, we edited on three-quarter inch. Something ridiculous. <laughs> it was remember. like we had, you remember <laughs> all these machines? That. And we were in a basement in Santa Rosa that was so cold, you know. It was terrible, but it was fun. It was wonderful, and it was so elating, you know, to to find someone that had my vision that could take whatever I thought of a step further. Mm -hmm. Like speaking the same language. And that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, kind of the language of the heart. That's what I speak with Vivian, mm -hmm. you know, because my films, I hope, have a heart, you know, and that that's what Vivian has facilitated. Right. And how was uh, the process, uh, kind of emotionally, of making La Ofrenda, which was different than your previous film? In a like you were saying, it, it was sort of a, a celebration yeah. of this um, tradition, cultural tradition. Right. It's you know highly important in in Mexican culture as well as other Latin American countries. So, speak to that a little bit, please. Well, it was joyous. It was joyous to be in Mexico. It was joyous to be in, in a place where, you know, not such a national tragedy had happened, you know, and to see how, you know, my culture was expressed, how I was a part of it. I felt like I came home again, you know, and I could appreciate it and I could love it in, in this, you know, wonderful way. Uh, the research was fabulous, you know. It all spoke to me and culturally, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure. I mean, having left when you were 13, did you go back to visit very often? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you said you went yeah. for the summers. Yes, I did. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I would go visit. But never never in, in this um, position, you know. 
Did you find uh, that you learned a lot more about the traditions of your own culture? Through oh, yes, time? yes, yes. I learned a lot about archaeology, anthropology, you know, history, all that stuff. Yeah, I was, I was really delighted and happy to be able to express this and also to share it with people because I felt like in this culture there was such a negation of death you know, like people didn't speak about it. And, you know, when people died, you just forget about them. This was a, a way of keeping that love alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I felt like there's a little bit of a, of a bridge between, you know, from Mexico to San Francisco in that you, mm -hmm. you start in Mexico and then you come to to San Francisco and observe where kind of just a, a growing celebration. Yes. And um, what did that uh, what did that open up for you in terms of the community that you were living in and how you perceive it and its relationship to your culture? Well, I mean, I, there's a whole embracing of, you know, both things and, you know, an appreciation for for this this city that has given me that that has given me a bridge to other places. You know, I don't know that I would have gotten it anywhere else. So that's why I'm so grateful to live here. I mean, this is my home now, you know. I, I, I don't yearn to go back to Mexico. I can always go back to Mexico. Mexico's a part of me, and it lives here, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, there definitely seemed to be a, a very poetic quality to that film. Was that and intended. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, the poetry of it, I think that's inherent, right, in trying to make a film about beauty and death and all that. You know, it's not about injustice. It's more about that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I'm kind of curious about the overall um, this isn't this isn't relative to a specific film, but at that time in the '80s, was it uh, was the vibe to the filmmaking community here in San Francisco very different than it is now? The in La Ofrenda, like around that time when you were making that, as well as Las Madres. You know, there's a, I think there's an eclectic kind of uh, there's always been an eclectic. Um, vibe to San Francisco. So there's a lot of ki uh, different kinds of filmmaking. And that's what's wonderful. And But we, I, I think more in the past and now that we were all friends, that we all can collaborate, that we can all understand each other. And there is, in a sense, of profound uh, um, competition. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's always been eclectic, I think. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, I just had to, you know, write a letter for for Chip Lord, you know, a member of uh, Ant Farm, <laughs> you know, who was who couldn't be more different from me. But we're friends, you know, and we, it, it that's the beautiful part of, um, you know, my work here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. That there's so many different people. Yeah. Well, and I know you made a, a few more films in between there. I'm going to jump up a little okay. bit to The Devil Never Sleeps. Okay. Which came out in 94. Right. Okay. Now, um, that was a really different film mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, how did you come to the decision to make that film? I My my interest in, in cinema and in film uh, always has originated with poetry with experimental film, you know, with uh, experimenting, uh, with art. And um, as you remember, as I told you, with The Mothers of Plaza de Mayo, I had to go see how a documentary was made. Well, by the time I finished um, La Ofrenda, I realized that I was not being true to myself that I had to be true to myself because I also have an agenda. I have an agenda of social justice, of representation. All those concerns are very important to me. 
and to my family and to to my people and to uh, to I think the way that cinema should express or should be able to give to people of every color that we have to be true to ourselves and we have to express it and we have to represent as they say mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> right um, and uh, I was very concerned about, well, just not concerned, but very interested in postmodernism. At that time, I was very interested in Baroque art. I was very interested in telenovelas. I was very interested in representation of a family, true representation, not idealized. And, uh, but I wasn't, kind of uh, making a recipe for myself. It all happened per chance that my uncle died. Mm -hmm. And um, when my uncle died, I was so engrossed in the family gossip. My mother would call, my father would call, my aunt would call and say, you know what happened, this happened. And no, he killed himself, oh my God. You know, and his wife, I think, wanted his money. You know, it's always the same thing. The woman always wants his money, right? It's like, I just couldn't believe what I was living through. And I just said, oh my God, maybe I should make a documentary about this. You know, it's so, so melodramatic. It's so over the top. And uh, I think it'd be nice, instead of showing the idealized Mexican family, you know, this is like really raunchy, you know? (laughs) So... I started, you know, I I wrote a proposal to get money for my TVS, and they gave me the money to do the whole film. And I said, okay, (laughs) you know, okay, let's go, you know. Now, how, before we go a little deeper into it, I want to ask, you said that you felt when you finished La Ofrenda that you weren't really being true to yourself. And you needed to be more true to yourself. And what do you mean by that? In what ways? I felt like, no, in La Ofrenda, I felt I was being true to myself. But it was a complicated truth because, you know, we had shot, different people had shot three different segments at different times that I had to put together. But I wanted I wanted a film to show just my vision of things, just me alone, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. in telling a story the way... The way my parents taught me, the way they would tell a funny story, the way they would tell about the past, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share that with everybody so that everybody could feel like uh, like they have a propensity to understand us in a way. Okay. Okay? Got it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so so then you got the money from ITVS and you just were like, okay, here we go? Yeah. What did, how did your family feel about it at first? when you? Well, I, I told my mother, you know, I would like to make a film about my uncle, you know, and his death. And my mother said, that's a wonderful idea, you know, but they didn't know what I was up to. And my father said, wonderful, yes, great, you know, they all, they all supported me. And, uh, and then I, I went about looking for a cinematographer that I loved, whose work I loved and I thought would do justice to it. And I looked for a sound man who would be the perfect sound man, you know? And I looked for people that would be perfect for the film. This was, this was my film in its entirety. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I did research and I went and I did a lot of uh, Super 8 films or no, High 8, you know, um, Scout. And from that, I devised, you know, how I was going to do it, and I just started doing it. So for this one, you you were uh, a little more, um, I can't think of the word right now, but you were a little more careful about selecting your collaborators. Yes. And, and prior to yes. going and shooting. Yes. It was... It was, I felt like I was making something that was really my art piece, you know? And I wanted to control all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It was no longer just a documentary. 
Yeah. Were there any things that you did differently in your approach uh, to sort of shooting or structuring the story or even in the editing process from your previous films? Different. In the shooting, yeah, a lot of things were different. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in I had this relationship with the uh, cameraman. We spoke the same kind of artistic language, and I said, you know, we're gonna make it into a postmodern film that has all these elements. You know, it has the structure of a telenovela, and it visually, you know, we're gonna use you know postmodern kind of techniques of okay, let's use a mirror. We're gonna use mirrors. And mirrors also, you know, kind of express a Baroque feeling to it, you know, because it multiplies the visual aspect. So we, that was the kind of conversation, that was a kind of uh, preparation that we did for the visual mm -hmm. uh, thing. Yeah, a lot of the visuals are just incredible, I have to say. like. The well, I love the use of the telenovela. <laughs> <laughs> right, the I telenovela thought, within the telenovela. Yeah, I mean, it was really, and you know, juxtaposed against a certain soundbite or moment. It was like, whoa. Um, and so, I I, I want to talk more about that, but also the just the, the sort of device of the the reflective sunglasses with the image in one eye. <laughs> how did you like? How did you come up with some of these ideas? Well, some of them were, you know, we prepared beforehand. Others, uh, we had to do a pickup shoot, you know, because we didn't have enough images that we shot in Mexico. Some of them we shot in our studio here that I had. I had a studio on Dolores Street. And like the tomatoes, you know, they're from like a, the health food store. They're organic, <laughs> you know. They're from here. And we shot them in the roof uh of the uh, building, um, the glasses were, because we didn't have that man speaking, I had to send someone to film him. Oh. So he filmed him, and I wanted to be present for that, so I I just dreamt it up, you know, let's do this, maybe, and this this will bring me, my presence into the, the screen at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, so it was all, it, some of them were things that were thought out long before, and others were more spontaneous because they were from the pickup shoot, you mm -hmm. know, how mm -hmm. we had to make it up, dream it up as we went. And that was like the enormous, enormously gratifying with the uh, cameraman and the sound man. I mean, to this day, we have a relationship, all of us. Yeah, I mean, it's really great how you describe it as like an art piece because it, it it shows. <laughs> yeah. It, it yeah. clearly shows in the work itself. Yeah. Um, how was it different, the experience, with just filming with your family, your own family, and you kind of having a, a presence in the film? Right, right. Well, I didn't want to have a presence originally, and I thought that, that I didn't need to have a presence. And, uh, but you see in the film, during the filming of the film, that I need to have a presence, you know? That there is, comes this moment when, you know, what are we gonna do? Ophelia's not gonna be on camera. And so what do I do? And Kyle, my cameraman goes, well, you gotta be on camera because we don't have our villain. What's wrong, you know? And that's where it started. When we're in the bed, they're in the motel. Yeah. So a lot of things, you know, were spontaneous things and other things. But it was what was beautiful. It was the working out of everything all together. You know, it's unlike anything else I've made. Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> also, I was bolder and crazier. And then being with my family... You know, it was, um, I felt like a, a double agent. Really? Oh, yeah. You know. It's a documentary, but, you know, ten times. But you know that you know them, and you know that you're going to betray them, and you know that you're going to tell things that they don't want to say. Yeah. 
you know, so it was hard. It was hard, but exciting. Yeah. <laughs> was there any, like, particular relationship or person that something unexpected came out of it? Oh, yeah. You? Oh, yes. Uh, you, uh, well, th what was unexpected was that my uncles and aunts were so angry with me when I finished the film. Oh, they were. Oh, yeah. They were. It was another film. It was like another telenovela. You know, my aunt died like a year afterwards, and my cousin said, you killed her. You killed her because she, she saw that film, and it damn near killed her. And you killed her with your film, you know? And I go to my mother and father, and I said, my cousin said, I killed my aunt. And my mother, oh, forget it. You didn't kill your aunt, you know? <laughs> Was that uh, your Aunt Luz? Yeah, my Aunt Luz. Yeah, she died of a stroke. But, you know, these wow. are um, things that I don't think I killed her. <laughs> I don't think you did either. But definitely you were very brave. I mean, that I couldn't help but think that as I watched it. Like, that takes a lot of guts to, Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, exploring the topic itself about a, a sort of mysterious uh, death circumstances. And then yes. what everybody had to say and the second wife. And it, yes. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, yeah. And it did very much seem like, um, you know, it's a search for the truth. Yeah. And um, which is interesting since you said you needed to be true to yourself. And <laughs> I know, huh? And sacrifice everybody else <laughs> for the truth, huh? <laughs> so, what truths were you left with when you were when you were done with the film and you had screened it and? Where, where were you with that? No, I felt like I was truthful to myself. I did exactly what I wanted to do with the film. I said it the way I wanted to say it. And I felt that also that I had a mission to do that. You know, that there was a mission for a Chicana to make a film about this at this time, you know, to be there in the canon you know, that these films, these things need to be said and talked about. That was one of the things. And, and then artistically, I felt very triumphant, you know. And in my family, I felt like my mother and father said, no, you did right. It's okay. Whatever you said, it was right. You didn't do anything wrong. Remember, they're very provincial, so they have a different attitude. And But they understood me, and they kind of said it was okay, you know? That's important to have that. Yeah, I thought so, and I think they knew that. Yeah. Mm hmm That's great. Yeah. How was it um, received outside of your, your aunts and uncles? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, this also this film was kind of a, a milestone for me, and it was like what it did is it it became like one of the very inspiring films for film students all over Latin America and in Spain. So that's, it became like a way of kind of showing my work outside of the U.S., more than in the U.S. It was very inspiring to the, to the kids to this day, to young people. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was good. And then, then there were a lot of, you know, films that they would do about their family because they know that, you know, in other cultures, it's so difficult to talk about the family and to uh, actually expose things that nobody wants to talk about. And it was a, uh, it was a no, uh, opening a door. You know, you can do it. You know, it was inspiring for them. So it really kind of um, became like crossing over a threshold of more realistic representation of the Mexican or Latin American culture and family life. That's right. Okay. Yeah. That's big. Yeah, I thought it was big. Yeah. To this day, it's big for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about just the, the choice that you made creatively about using the clips of telenovelas in the film. Oh, that, that was, was you yeah. Know. <laughs> you know, um, I think when we were, it was when we went to the acupuncturist. We, 
I, you know, we became very spontaneous with the things that we would do. I was very exhausted, and I said, I need to go to an acupuncturist because I can't sleep, I can't rest. You know, I'm just always thinking and trying to do something. So we went to the acupuncturist, and while I was getting acupuncture, you know, the ladies that are watching the telenovela, you know, they're, everybody, the crew is waiting for me to get my acupuncture. The ladies, the, the receptionist, they're watching the telenovela. It was 3 o'clock. The whole city shut down. Nobody, <laughs> everything was shut down, completely shut down, you know? And everybody was just looking at the TV, you know, at the telenovela. And every day that we, it was 3 o'clock, everybody's gone. Oh, they're watching the telenovela. You know, and we went and watched the telenovela, and the telenovela was exactly what was happening in my film. So we filmed it. So it became a part of the film, you know? Yeah. That was great. I yeah. really, that was. <laughs> <laughs> Just popped into my head. It's a little bit of a departure, but what happened with your husband? Because when you were making Las Madres, he didn't really want you to be spending your time that way. But you pursued, you pursued it anyway. Yeah. So did that? That's when we broke up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It 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 ended. Yeah. Okay. It was just uh, we had. I wanted to continue to make films, and he wanted a different life, mm -hmm. so it just didn't work out. Okay. Yeah. My poor kids. <laughs> they have you. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Um, in one of the um, articles that I read, it credited you and this film, The Devil Never Sleeps, as kind of pushing the boundaries of of documentary and sort of the, the genre in general. And do you agree with that? I hope so. <laughs> yes, I think so. Was that an intention you set out with? I was, I have to tell you that I felt like I didn't have that intention, but I felt like I was possessed by the film and possessed by the desire to make this thing. It's like somebody who wants to make a house, you know? I felt like that. I, I'm, I'm, nothing is, was going to stop me and everything was a possibility. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so then how did you feel about its general reception? I mean, you talked about the students and, and that. Opening. Yes. What? I, I thought it was wonderful, you know. I, and uh, the way that everyone received it, really, I mean, here they were very kind, but I think did not understand quite what I was trying to say. Really? But every, in a way, in a way, the audiences, you know. I, I think the institutions have recognized, you know, and they did. I mean, the film was in new directors, you know, and you know, the museums really appreciate that film. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the audiences, I think we're a little perplexed, you know? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's what I think, but I don't know. Maybe, I, you know, Vivian has a different idea. She, I mean, Vivian says, that's the greatest film I, that we made. <laughs> it's, it's certainly remarkable. Yeah. Uh, work. And, and so how was it working with Vivian that time? I mean, I know it's just been a wonderful collaboration with yeah. her, but was there anything uh, different that time or sort of a new, new ground that you guys reached? <laughs> no, you know, it was, it, it was freeing. It was freeing for Vivian too, I think, you know, and when you feel that free to create, it, it was an, kind of an ecstatic uh, uh, artistic endeavor. That's what it was for a lot of people. That's what it was, and I've never said it like that, but, you know, it was an ecstasy that we were, you know, creating this thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, great. It was fun. That's really great. <laughs> well, then I wanted to jump up to yes. your film in 99. Okay. It was Corpus. Right. About the late Tahana singer Selena. Yes. And her death. Yes. Um, what inspired you to make that film? Um... Again, you know, it was more like of a social justice kind of thing. Um, I came into the living room where my mother and father were watching television, and I saw, uh, I didn't know who she was, Selena. 
she was singing and dancing. And for the first time, I saw a brown woman singing in English, and I didn't understand it. You have to understand the time, you know, in those, it wasn't common to see that. And I walked in and I said, who's that? To my mother and father, and my mother and father said, it's Selena, you know? <laughs> they, and they gave me the whole rundown, you know, on who Selena was, and I thought, wow, you know, that's great, because we have struggled so long and so hard, you know, to get any of our images in the television and in, in the theaters, and here it is, it's happening, and she's got this magnificent voice. Yeah. She had this great voice, you know, she could have been an opera singer. And uh, I said, oh, I'd love to make a film about her, you know? And uh, that's how it happened. And was yeah. that when she was still alive? No, no, I think she had died. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 she had died. And it, it yeah. was very recent. Okay. But I, had, I didn't even know who she was, Yeah. you know? And it was my parents who told me. So uh, I started to do the research to do that. And then in the course of doing the research, I realized that there was like this kind of Shakespearean tragedy going on at the same, you know, the father wanting, being more ambitious than the daughter and pushing the daughter and not pushing her so hard and not knowing her vulnerabilities, you know? And uh, in a way, in a very indirect way, actually exposing her to this terrible danger of being killed, which she was. Yeah, the Shakespearean tragedy, that makes a lot of sense. Don't you think? Yeah. That's what it was. And, and that's what I was trying to tell, that it wasn't just a singer, but that there is this other tragic, uh, these tragic elements that are unspoken about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really sad, really tragic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, How would you say that the exploration of Selena's life and death is similar to what you explored in Las Madres and then later in Senorita Extraviada? It seems to me like um, it has a lot to do between the parent and the child. It's all parent-child things, mm -hmm. you know? How you protect your children, how you don't protect your children, what you do for your children, what you don't do for your children. Why do you think you're drawn to that subject? I just became aware of it right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if you see, if we go back and to where we started, where you're telling me, asking me, how was it to come to, to the U.S. and to have a child who is the uh, interpreter a child who does the work of an adult is a way of not protecting a child. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's where my mind went. But <laughs> <laughs> Freudian. <laughs> <laughs> what did you what, what What did you take away from from making Corpus? Like, what was your um, I don't know kind of feeling about that whole thing? I mean, I thought it was. Uh, I think when you when when you read about it, it's like oh it's a documentary about Selena and, you know oh she, I don't know you just kind of think like it might be a little bit um, melodramatic which, which it is yeah but it's also in, maybe it's the tragic the sort of Shakespearean tragedy element to it but it's so it's so impactful it's a very powerful yes. film and perhaps it's the the representation of all those young girls who yes just, I mean it was like a their first. Idol. Idol. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. You know, um, yeah, I think it has to do a lot with that, you know, that there was, this was a time in the history of the Chicano people, you know, when they first had this idol, you know, and how it was taken away. Mm -hmm. And in a, I mean, it's repeated over and over again. Like we can think about Jenny Rivera, you know, like it keeps on happening. And, and, and the question comes up, why aren't there more? Why aren't there more? Why are they so uh, singular? 
why are they so alone, you know, in their existence? Uh, to me, mm -hmm. to me, you know, and that's something that I want to bring up, you know, that why aren't there more representations of uh, Chicanos, of people of color in all the media because we are here, you know? Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, uh, does it make sense to you? I don't oh, yeah. Know. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. What was the, uh, from your perspective, the, the general reception to the... The Selena mm -hmm. film? Oh, people liked it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because they love Selena. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, also the film is, is, comes with the story that it tells. And like I say, it's a tragedy. Um, it, it's not, it's not like the devil never sleeps. It's nothing that's been crafted in this other way and complex and expensive way. You know, it's, it's a cheaper version of, <laughs> of the documentary. What was, what was it like dealing with her father? I mean, was he a, was he a, a willing subject or was he a kind of reticent? Like, and, and what did he think about the final product? Oh, dealing with the father would have made a better film. <laughs> The father was really amazing. He was a very incredibly charismatic and manipulative man, you know? And um, he wanted me to make it because it would be more um, publicity for him, you know, to continue with his business things with Selena. But he wanted me to tell the story that he wanted. Mm. And I couldn't. So there were moments when we would gather together and he would say, you must cut this out and you must put that in. And I won't say what I would cut out or put in. And I said, uh, no, no, I can't do that because that would be unethical. And he said, but who would know? It's only you and me in this office. <laughs> wow. You know, and so, you know, it was really interesting, and he was interesting, and he was a Shakespearean character, you know. That, that's so weird. <laughs> I'm sure it happens a lot. <laughs> I'm sure it does too, but just, um, I guess because of this, this particular set of circumstances, it's his daughter, and she's I know. dead. I know. And he's partially responsible. Right, and he felt the responsibility, but he wanted to make light of it, but, you know, and uh, I wanted to say to him, you know, hey, you know, you should have watched your daughter, you should have done this, you should have, but I couldn't, no. you know, it was so sad. It was at the t same time, it was so sad, yeah. so sad. The mother was so sad that she could never even talk to me or hardly look at me. She was like grieving, and this had been, you know, some time. Wow. Yeah, it was, uh, mothers suffer so much. Yeah. Wow. I feel like Senorita Extraviada, which was, came out in, I think, 2001, um, is, is very much a continuation on the same themes that you've been exploring. Yes. Um, how, let's start with how you, um, got inspired to do that film. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, you make me kind of think about sub themes that I'm always like, th that are always present in my work. Uh, there's multiple themes. And uh, one of the things that for me, um, has a lot to do with uh, what I need to say in film because I, there's a need for me to say certain things. And one of them is about injustice, you know, like gross injustices where something can be done that we can help. I, and this was one of them. I read a very small article in a newspaper, in a Mexican newspaper, because I'm always reading, I read newspapers from all over. I'm a documentary filmmaker, right? So you're always like, you know, looking out for everything. And, um, but I, I read newspapers from where I come from, from Chihuahua. And there was a very small article. It was just like about this big, you know. And it was by Esther Chavezcano, 
who was uh, late. I'll tell you who she was later. But in any case, what the article said was that 36 girls have gone missing in Ciudad Juarez, and no one knows what happened to them. Basically, there was, you know, more details, but that was the gist of it. And I thought, what? This is so crazy. Such a little article. You know, why, why don't they talk about it more? What's wrong? So I started doing a lot of research, and that's when I found out you know, what had been happening, that there were these disappearing girls. You know, they were found dead later on. And uh, the writer had been Esther Chavez Cano, who was the first woman who started, uh, who was a journalist, and started counting the girls as they disappeared. She kept the count. She's died since, and it's been 20 years. Wow. And the counting continues. Really? Continues. You know, there's been thousands of girls who have been murdered in Ciudad Juarez. And this happens every month. And still happens. Oh. So, I mean, this is right now the present. But when I started the film in 1999, around 98, you know, it was a very mysterious thing. And there were moments when they would blame different people. There was an Egyptian man who had worked in the maquiladoras. He was blamed for the disappearances. So not only do some of my films have these thematic um, things, proposals, but uh, they also have to have a cinematic quality to them. And the cinematic quality is that it's a mystery. You know, it's an incredible mystery. And that attracts me to making a film. You know, even though it, it deals with all these multiple things. Mm -hmm. So that's what attracted me to it. So how did you start with that one? Because that is um, involved a lot of the authorities already. So how did you uh, approach everyone and where did you start? Right, you know, here, uh, here I go again to Chihuahua, right? Where I came from, right? The same place. Um, I went and I saw Esther Chavez Cano, you know, who was the activist, who was a woman who started, you know, counting, who started organizing around it. And, you know, I asked her, Esther, you know, where do I go? What do I do? You know, the way you start any documentary. So she started sending me to the different mothers of the disappeared girls in the different organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started telling me their story. And that's how I started. Uh, is that the aspect you wanted me to mm -hmm. talk about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how were you received by um, the other side of the story? I mean, I would imagine that the families were really welcoming of an opportunity to talk about what was happening and to kind of get it out there more. But what about the authorities? Right. The authorities, as you can see in the film, they, they were kind of a little bit disdainful. They wanted to ignore it. They didn't want to talk about it. I don't understand to what extent at that moment they were involved in the knowledge of what was happening to the girls because now it's almost known that it has a lot to do with sexual slavery and um, kidnapping by, you know, the um, organized crime, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, it, it, the authorities in Ciudad Juarez are so corrupt, you know, that they just pretend, they feigned ignorance, basically, you know. In the in ineptitude. So was it? Uh, you said it's now known that it had more to do with sexual slavery, and kidnapping. So it wasn't necessarily the the police, because it really seems it comes across in the film that the that really it's the police perpetuating. It's everybody. Yeah. It's everybody. 
You know, imagine all the people that know what happens to these girls and no one is talking. I mean, what is it? What is the threat that they're living under that they can't say? Yeah. It's enormous. So uh, I think it has a lot to do with organized crime because organized crime, I mean, right now, if you read the news, you understand that, you know, even Felipe Calderón, who was the last president, said organized crime is trying to take over the government. Wow. So it speaks volumes of, you know, who's, you know, putting an, under the rug. Mm -hmm. The authorities were no help. Yeah. You know, no help whatsoever. And on the contrary, they would send us to the wrong places. So basically what we did, we did our own investigation. I had a wonderful, you know, uh, at that time student, Gemma Cubero, who was my partner in the investigation, you know, and uh, we found all kinds of things out. And that was the way we did it. We did it through the mothers. We did it through the, you know, references the mothers would give us and we would you know follow that through and uh, but ultimately there was there was one moment when someone said to me you know whatever you do whatever you do you can say anything you want but never mention a name because the minute you mention a name you'll be dead wow i was about to ask you if you ever felt unsafe oh i mean i've been threatened I mean, this was the most unsafe film I've ever made in my life. It was very uh, frightening. You know, we were followed. You know, we were spied upon here. Really? Yes, here. You know, so it was terrible. I mean, I, I, I got like really bad high blood pressure after I finished because I was, I was just so terrified for so long. But if I'm terrified and I'm just a filmmaker, imagine how those poor girls felt. Wow. Yeah. No, they, I think that was really the most dangerous uh, film I've ever made. Did you ever have a time where you, where you considered uh, putting it down? Or did you always feel... No. Okay. No, no. No, it, it had to be finished and... Yeah. I was scared, but I and I was threatened and scared. But but Esther said to me, "I said, Esther, I've been threatened, you know." And she said, "We all have been threatened." <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, but when it's your first time, it's like <laughs> I'm a virgin. Yeah, <laughs> right. I've never been threatened. Wow. Yeah. Um, I just. I'm, I wonder about, well, the, the film has a very, um, a quality of like being a requiem. Yes. And, and I read a couple articles that also use that same word. Yes. And um, I just wondered if that was your intention. And um, did you choose music with that in mind? Because the music is very powerful and very effective. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yes. I think that... Uh, it was meant to be a requiem, and that's why we used that music. And I love that music to begin with. And also I felt that there was something that was so important about this film that was I could not ever show a dead body of a girl and the things that were done to those girls. It's so traumatizing and horrible. And I only think about the relatives, and looking at a body like that, that used to be their loved one, would be such an uh, abusive thing to do, that we said we can't ever use that. You know, we kind of, Vivian and I, because, you know, it was at the end, the editing is what takes the longest in the crafting of the, of the film. We said, you know, the girls, Vivian said, no, no. I mean, this sounds a little hippish, but I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> You know, Vivian said, I feel like at that moment there were 200 girls that had been counted dead. She said, I feel like those 200 girls are behind us and they're editing with us, with us and they're, you know, they're guiding us. So let's just follow them. Wow. <laughs> that gives me chills. 
Yes, but it was that powerful. It was that powerful and that wonderful. And we said, yes, the girls, the girls are with us and we have to represent them right. We have to do the thing right that is right. We can't, like now you see sometimes some things about what is in the big deal is like the bodies are all bloodied and you know, this kind of desecration of the human body, I think affects the viewers. And if we elevate it to this level of, we are remembering you, this is your requiem. You were a loved person and your mother is proud to be able to see this film and say that was about my daughter without feeling bad, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. That was important. Yeah. That was very important. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, just as a mother of two daughters, it's, yes. it's incredibly hard to absorb yeah the gravity of of what was happening or what still happens that's right <clears throat> it is it's very very hard yeah, i understand you yeah um there's a lot of evil that we don't see real evil not movie evil right you know and and uh you're it's good to teach the girls to be able to see where it's at mm -hmm. and um similar to las madres mm -hmm. here we had families and mothers yes and sisters um yes. standing up and trying to be heard and find out what happened mm -hmm. to their loved ones so there's definitely that connection <laughs> that's <laughs> right yeah. that's right yeah yeah, it, it 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 has that similarity. It's like this struggle and this this uh, disrespect for human rights that exists in Latin America. You know, it, it it's it's all over Latin America. You know, in Brazil, it was the same thing do, during the dictatorship. In Bolivia, everywhere. You know, in the seventies, and and I'm bringing this up because it's also now. You know incredible disregard for human rights and uh, we need to pay attention to that mm -hmm. I couldn't help kind of feeling a, a sense of the helplessness that some of the families must have yeah. been feeling and I wondered what that was like for you when you were making the film I think what helpless helplessness was one of them but I was doing something active that made me feel like perhaps it could bring about some change, that I had hope. They didn't have hope. What I had was anger more than anything. I was so angry. You know, it brought up all this anger towards the authorities for not doing a good job, for not finding out what's happening to these girls. Yeah. Yeah, and what would you say is that overarching statement about like the state and sort of the patriarchal right um, you know yeah uh, I I you know I'm kind of speechless about it because I don't even know what to say this is this is not this is the state allowing these things to happen right and there are men basically I think I'm sure there's women involved men who are allowed to to do this and have been allowed to do this in Mexico for forever and is just overlooked because it's men and it's money, mm. you know, and the state is responsible. The state is responsible. The state has to answer to all those women, to all, you know, the people of, you know, the families of the dead and in they're, they're ignoring it. And this country is ignoring it. This country is ignoring it. Nobody talks about it. Nobody cares about it. Nobody cares about poor brown women. That's the bottom line, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a culturally ingrained disrespect for women that Mexicans have. Where does that originate? You know, it's like a friend of mine said, it doesn't matter where it came from. Just stop it. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's the thing. Because in a way, we want to know where it originates. It's about it's a struggle for power, it seems to me. 
-hmm. I don't know. But, you know, the thing is, no, you can't do it. You're just not going to do it. You're stronger. You know, you're, um, you know, you can do this and you can do that. Instead of destroying them, you know, cherish them and protect them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's so animalistic. It is. It definitely is. Don't you think? Yeah. So do you feel like your perspective as a woman and as a Chicana is front and center for all your filmmaking? No, I think they're my interest. But I think basically um, at the center is an artist. You know, that's, that's who I feel. An artist that's concerned about, you know, Chicanos, that's uh, concerned about human rights, that's concerned about women, children, you know, and men too. I'm concerned about all of it. You know, I, I went to Catholic school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Catholic school really does, they teach you some compassion. You know, somehow it got into my brain. And, um, you know, that's my struggle. Mm -hmm. You know? But uh, there's a very you know, very many branches of interest. I couldn't say that I'm one particular thing. It's multifaceted yeah. identity. <laughs> <laughs> How do you define documentary? Um, you know, I think it's an investigation into uh, a, a truth, the truth of something. You know, not necessarily, it's not always like, the pristine truth, um, or the um, the ultimate truth, but it's a search for the truth. That's how I think of documentary. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in terms of its form, I think that um, it could be, you know, almost anything. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> how much or how little or should it be defined at all, the perspective of the filmmaker? Like, the re oh. you know? Uh, like the some... subjectivity, you mean? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Uh, I think we can't get away from subjectivity at all. You know, we are the creators of this uh, uh, work. So um, we're always kind of uh, expressing our subjectivity. We can try to hide it and pretend that it's not there, but I think it's only a pretense. Uh, in reality, it's always there, whether it's in, a, in with a very big voice or, or just very subtle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, I think the only, the only films that have influenced me um, greatly have been kind of after the fact some of the young people that have made some wonderful films with a lot of creativity and, and a lot of involvement that uh, didn't exist in the past. I think that we come from, my generation comes from a tradition of documentary being very staid, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the younger ones that are uh, reinventing documentary. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I love them, you know? There's so many of them, especially in Europe, you know, in Latin America, they're much bolder. Really? Yeah, they're not bound by, um, they're not bound by these uh, notions of, you know, cinema verite or, you know, all these other movements. No, you know, they, they in fact, they, in Barcelona, they teach creative documentary. And in Latin America, in Colombia, and in, in, in Argentina, it's called creative documentary. That means that you really, you know, created with some other elements and what you're constrained with here in the U.S., I think. I think we look towards the pioneers of documentary with great reverence, you know, which is fine, and I think that's good. But it's also good to get away from it. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Why do you think? Just the creative documentary 
in other countries because it's I think here people would call it like experimental slash documentary right um and why does it have to be defined like that right yeah yeah um <clears throat> are there um any specific films or filmmakers that were particularly important to you earlier on in your career there's so many of them so many yeah so many great filmmakers you know and not necessarily documentarians you know experimental filmmakers or like People like Buñuel, like, you know, mm. yeah, think about Buñuel. I mean, talk about experimental, you know. <laughs> um, you know, many, 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 maybe too many to mention. It, I mean, I always find some virtues with every film, you know, and someone is always trying something different. Um, I, and I allow those influences to come through me, you know. And I, it isn't like I follow one or two or three. It's like I see, you know, I see the defects and I see the virtues of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Are there any current filmmakers that you most admire? Uh, I, I just saw a film that I, the cinematography I love so much. Um, and it's ab actually up for an Academy Award. It's called the the color the uh, blue is the. You know what I'm saying? I do, and I don't remember the name of it. Blue um, is the best color, or the loveliest color, or something. It's someplace over there. It's yeah. yeah. I thought that was like really amazing camera work and amazing acting. You know, aside from all. Uh, other things that it has, but those are the things that really struck me in the directing. Mm -hmm. Cool, good. Um, what do you feel are the most important um, technical skills that a documentarian needs to master? Oh my God, I, a documentarian needs to master most of all dealing with people. That is the, the greatest skill you can have. Um, for example, myself, I'm terrible technically. Terrible. Don't ask me to do it, you know, because I'll probably do the wrong thing. Um, I think it's about telling stories, and storytelling has to do with personal relations. And uh, that's the, the number one virtue we have to have. Mm -hmm. You know, you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh. What's your point of view on where documentary filmmaking is today versus when you started working in it? Oh my God. When I started working on it, it was very, very um, conventional, you know, in looking back at it, you know, and very much rooted in this whole notion of being objective, you know, which it, it's almost impossible. Now everybody agrees. Now every, everyone has changed their minds, right? That you cannot be objective when you make a documentary. Um, so I think people have become more experimental. You know, they are willing to experiment much more. But I don't know that the people that get the films out there or that fund the films are as open to it as the filmmakers. Yeah. I think I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they're holding us back in a way mm -hmm. by not being bold enough by funding things that, you know, could be much more beautiful. Yeah. Talk about some of the technical uh, changes or in filmmaking technology that, that, have, that have occurred from when you started, because there have been a lot. Well, let's see, I'll give you an example. Um, more recently, like last year, I had a retrospective at uh, New York MoMA, and uh, they wanted to acquire my films to have in their permanent collection. And we had to go back and create, you know, a copy for them. And we started, you know, with film, you know, real film, 16 millimeter film. And we just moved on from 16. And then I told you that we edited La Ofrenda three quarter inch. And then, you know, and then we just moved, kept on moving. When we got to The Devil Never Sleeps, it was a mixture of video and and 16 millimeter. And then it became Selena. It was like a, a mini DV, right? And then uh, on 
one of my latest films is made, you know, in a total digital format, you know, a very, I don't even know the, you know, the, the exact digital uh, format, but, you know, a small little camera. With a little chip. With a little chip. <laughs> and I, and, but what I realized is that in order for MoMA to buy all the stuff, they needed to get a stable enough format to keep. Mm. And most of the digital is not stable. The only stable, stable films were the 16 millimeters films, you know? And I thought, oh, wow, that means that a lot of this digital work is not going to survive. So what did you do? No, no, I mean, they, they took the second best, you know, a beta SP. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Huh? And that's an old format. Yeah. So we, you know, we've run the gamut, you know, formats. How about in the editing side of it? Oh, wow. Well, the edit that becomes also problematic, very problematic for Vivian. You know, you have to always keep up with, the, with all the, the latest programs. And how do you do that? You know, you need immense drives, and it just never ends. It's become, I think, more of a, it's much more expensive than 16. It's become more expensive. It's faster. But also, I think 16 gave you a rhythm because of its limitations, you know, that was very human. And now we've just gone so fast and so, you know, quick. Yeah. So you, you and Susana edited Las Madres, and, and then you edited uh, La, Ofrenda. La Ofrenda on a flatbed, right? Yes, yes. And then were all your later ones done on, well, three-quarter inch and then... Well, added? we started, the La Ofrenda was in three-quarter inch, and then we did the film version, you know, and then there's like everything, on everything. We've gone the whole gamut. Yeah. 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 I don't know if that answers your question. What okay. did you want to... Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. The changes yeah. of the sort of... Yeah, it, and it's not easy to, to mm -hmm. go through all that. Yeah. You know? Um, tell me a little bit about what you take into consideration when choosing a, a project, a subject matter. I think, first of all, that it needs to tell a story. You know, a story that's compelling or that's interesting and that people are going to like. And also a story that will get funded. That's very important. Because you could have a great, no, no, I don't know that you could have a great story and not have it funded. I think a great story is a great story, but you, you, that's a great consideration, the funding aspect of it. Yeah. 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 No, I think the most important thing is the story, that you have a, a good story that also reflects your values. Mm -hmm. And walk me through the steps that you take in... Uh, your pre-production, production and post for, you know, like how much, how much, um, how much do you know when you're getting ready to go out and shoot about what you want the final product to be and how much is created in the field and how much is created in post? Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. And I know it's different for each project, but just sort of generally, I want right. to get a sense of your yeah. creative process. First of all, I ruminate, which is, I don't know that that's a good thing, but I ruminate a lot about a project. I ruminate, I think of all the possibilities. This is a cheap way, right? <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. I can ruminate, I can think, I can invent in my head. And then um, that is the, the first thing. Then I put it down in a story, right? And once it's in a story, then I break it down to where, you know, I'm going to go film, who I'm going to get, how I'm going to get it um, financed, all that stuff. Uh, and I try to stick to the story, you know, unless there's something extraordinary that happens during the filming, then we film that. 
But basically, I've never been derailed by, by an occurrence. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I've taken detours, but never derailed where, like, I've lost my story. Do you ever have, uh, or do you have an example of a time when you're, you're out and you're shooting and it could kind of go in another direction and you really have to say, like, no, that's not pertinent to the story I'm trying to tell. That's a different story. You know, do you have any? Well, I can tell you the story of, uh, of The Devil Never Sleeps, Ophelia, when I asked Ophelia, you know, we want to do an interview with you. And she says, no. And you see it in the film, that, that moment when I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm crestfallen. She said no, you know. She's just getting her vengeance now on me. And, and Jose, who is my sound man, goes, well, Luli, you know, we got to, you got to, or Kyle said to me, it, it's not in the film, but it's at that moment that it all came back, that it all happened, it gelled, and they said, well, you gonna, you're going to have to take over. You're going to have to be in the film now, even though you don't want to. So that's a moment when it switched, mm -hmm. you know. But the story continued on being the same. It's just that we didn't have that character, so we had to, Grab another one. Right, right. Okay. Um, so then when you're done shooting and you haven't been derailed, <laughs> <laughs> right, and you come back and you start looking at all your footage, mm -hmm. what's that like for you? Oh, it's wonderful. You know, it's a, it's a great moment because I'm looking at it with new eyes, with Vivian's eyes, you know? We have all the transcripts, you know, we look through it you know she's a very positive person which is wonderful she's never going to say oh that's really awful you know oh this is great oh we can put it with that you know she's very open and um it's like it's made in heaven it's a marriage made in heaven with vivian you know uh that is another very very exciting moment but it's not as physically trying as the filming, right. you know, it's all there and it's now a ma matter of uh, elaborating, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think that we change directions with that. Like you said, you know, do I get derailed? N not, not often, not, no, I, I could almost say like with the exception of this thing, you know, and the devil never sleeps. Mm -hmm. That's when we change, but I can't think of it. I, I, kind of really stick to the story. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Because if I did, you know, it would really, I don't know where I would go. I'm not that disciplined. Mm -hmm. you know, like you are. If... <laughs> no, I mean, if I get derailed, then I'd have to take that road. And who knows where it would take me, and who knows who would fund me. I mean, you have to consider all these things. Right. Yeah. So, so you, you have your transcripts and you have your footage. Do you do as like a paper cut? Do you have a big board mm -hmm. where you're rearranging scenes? Like how do you, how do you map it out? We do that. We cut, you know, all the dialogue. We do a script. And the other thing that we have done in the past, when we worked at Skywalker with The Devil Never Sleeps, we had a room about this big, and we had a still of each shot, the, the head of each shot. And we put it all around the room and looked at it to construct the visual kind of language and, you know, where we were going. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was a long process. How but long were you editing that one? I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it was a long time. Maybe, you know, almost a year. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That is a long time. Yeah. But it, it was like a piece of lace. You know? Yeah. That's a great analogy. Let's talk a little bit about ethics. Okay. And, you know, crossing the line or not crossing the line. And yeah. Where do you stand on that? And, and when and how has it come into your, to your work? Right. Or to uh, your, you know, your experience in making. Right. I mean, in general, I, you know, I, I believe in being ethical in making films. And I think that I've followed, you know, that, that notion. Um, 
with the devil never sleeps, you know, I felt like I was really like flirting with, you know, being unethical, mm -hmm. you know, and, but the way that I addressed it is that I talked about it in the film itself, that it was a dilemma, you know, and I made the audience kind of complicit, you know, and that was one way to kind of expose it and for the audience to know that I was not hiding it, you know. That's how I dealt with it. And, and in that case, was it primarily about Ophelia? And, yes. And recording that conversation? Yes, yes, yes. The thing that, that happened with Ophelia is that with Ophelia it was very difficult to get her okay about anything. You know, and we did record that conversation without asking her. And then once I recorded the conversation and tried to ask her, there was no way that she was going to give me an okay. And I'm, I, I'm in this incredible dilemma that I put myself into for being so, I'm not going to say. But, you know, it was like, what am I going to do now? I can't put this on public television. You know, I don't have a release. Yeah. You know, I don't have a release. What do I do? What do I do? And I ruminated, you know, for months about it. And finally, I thought, well, actually, I didn't think about it. It was my assistant, Socorro Aguilar, who said, Luli, <laughs> she said, I do voiceovers for films. Why don't we do Ophelia's voiceover in that little piece? I'll do my voice, pretending I'm Ophelia, and we'll put it in the credits at the end. I bet you didn't know that. Well, I saw that in the credits, but I was like, wait a minute, that wasn't Ophelia? It was, most of it was Ophelia, except for some, some piece that was key. I mean, I'm talking to Ophelia all the time. Yeah. You know, that's, in, it's normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's. Yes, we have, I had to, I had to do Soko's voice, that Socorro's voice. Which spot? At the end? Yeah. Okay, I'll have to look at it again. Yeah. No, you know what I have that would be very important is I have a DVD of her voice doing of the, everything that was recorded that she did. Okay. Yeah. No, the only, I'm sorry, I'm telling you the other thing. The only spot that it is Ophelia oh. is at the end. You'll hear her voice. We put her voice in a little bit so people could, like if I had this conversation, you would, I said, this is Ophelia's voice. Okay. Do you get it? Yeah. yeah. But these are all the machinations. <laughs> you know, this is all the craziness I had to go through for not having a release. And then it just stopped me and it froze me and I love the film and people love the film, but you know, there was this big defect, mm. you know? Well, I thought it was a really uh, great way to address it the way you do in the film with your voiceover or with your narration about the fact that you were facing this. Oh, I had dilemma. to. Yeah. I had to, yeah. otherwise, all my other work would suffer. Mm -hmm. I would suffer, you know, the consequences of my actions. Have there been any other instances of, of sort of ethical dilemma for you as a filmmaker? Just with, uh, with Selena's father, you know, that he didn't want me to, to put something in that he had said because he, you know, people would be condemning him. Mm -hmm. That was hard. Yeah. Those, those are the two times that was really, really hard. How do you handle it with your subjects ahead of time? Do you tell them that they can see a cut before it's done, or what do you... No. Okay. I, I never ask for people's approval of the cut. They, once they sign their release, just like, <laughs> you know, it's gone. Well, that's what I thought, but then there's something about the way you were referencing your conversation with Selena's father... 
seemed like he he was he saw something and he was saying don't include that but it wasn't it was just in conversation yeah okay yeah yeah okay yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're always so suspect huh? <laughs> well you've done I mean you have selected very um, uh, what's the word I don't know um, not necessarily controversial but yeah in a way so the topics are um, personal and political and affecting <laughs> yeah so Um, when we were first talking at the very beginning, you, you talked about how your father wanted you to, to be a journalist. Yeah. And uh, it made me think about this question here on, that was, I knew was coming later in the interview about, um, what do you think, um, how do you think of your films? Are they, are they a record of a particular time and place? Are they a, a reportage? Are they art? Are they something in between or a little of all of it, you know, I kind of want to hear your, uh, yeah. thoughts on that. I think about it as a, a record of a particular time, number one, you know, and, uh, also an expression of art and also an expression of political concerns. Mm -hmm. That's how, you know, a little bit of everything, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little more depth about the relationship between the sound and picture? In your work and how you um, how you marry those, how they work together, and and uh, when you're editing, sound and picture. But you didn't say music. Oh, I mean music as well. Yeah, sound, you music, mean yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Soundtrack, whether yeah. you know layering yeah. of sounds. Uh, using sound is really important, very very important, and that's one thing that I've learned from Vivian. You know. She was originally a sound editor. So, I mean, this is a person who has worked in big films that where sound is very important. And so she taught me, you know, all about rhythm, sound, tone, you know, uh, nuance, and also the marriage of, you know, of uh, the visuals with the sound and how important it is in silence silences you know that's also very important so um it's a concert basically you know you're visualizing a kind of a concert if you were to just hear the sound by itself it would be a life almost without the pictures mm -hmm. but the pictures really add to it um it's very carefully crafted i can tell you that that's one of the most important things for us Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, when you see, I mean, I can't think of any examples right now, but like a, a documentaries where it, the sound really suffers. It's like whatever they're, they're, the film is about, the topic of the film is, is really powerful and poignant, but their sort of production values were really <laughs> bad. It, yeah, does it like take away from the film for you? Does it Oh yeah, it does. It does. It's just a carelessness, really. You know, and or maybe ignorance of not knowing how important the sound is. You know, how it creates one tonality. You know, visually and uh, audio yeah, how do you say it? Orally. Orally. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, all the elements in filmmaking are so important. I, you know, and I think that a lot of uh, the success of my work has to do with the carefulness with, with which everything is put together. You know, and, and everything, we're never really in a big hurry. That's important. Yeah. And also I think it's very limiting for other filmmakers that perhaps don't have the time, you know, to do that, to craft it so carefully. At what point um, or at what stage in the process do you start working on soundtrack specifically with music? Do you start pretty early on in the editing process or? No, later? I think we look at all the footage. We look at also what the sound that has been recorded, you know, um, in place and uh, what is inspiring to me or what is the, the, 
the inspiration that drives me to make this film. Like with The Devil Never Sleeps, there's a lot of different, it's a mixture of sounds and they all came to me when I was either filming or when we were in post-production. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very open. It's uh, not nothing, you know, that's composed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, how is it different to work with uh, a composer ver versus, you know, music, just making music selections? I like both things. I like both things a lot. I mean, I love working with Todd Buckleheit. He's just very, very talented and, and a wonderful composer and very sensitive. And I think the three of us work really well together. But I also like the spontaneity of just choosing random pieces of music that I think might go together. That, that's, the, that's the most fun that I have sometimes with films, mm. you know? Because, I mean, I was trained as an artist, so I have that impulse, you know, to just, like, ah, put everything in the pot, you know? Yeah. Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask, is, like, what's the happiest time for you in the life of a project? Is, there, is that it, or is it maybe the first screening of a, you know, I don't know, what, <laughs> what might it be? I think I think it's in the editing room post production at the end of post production when all the elements come together, when we have you know kind of reworked everything and we've woven something that you know we think is going to be it, and we look at it and we'll just say this is it, it's it we're done. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful moment when we say we're done. Yeah, we did everything we were going to do. And so who's your first audience? Like, who do you first screen it for? Do you, do you get, uh, for, for feedback, like you have your, you know, you haven't locked yet or you have, you know, you're gonna, you're done, but you're not done, done. <laughs> yes, we have doubts, you mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. yeah. If we have doubts, then we would bring someone in that would be able to understand what we're trying to do, number one, and what we're trying to say and we would say, we're trying to say this, and are we saying it, mm -hmm. you know, or not? Yeah. Uh, it depends. I mean, I don't, I can't say that I have like an audience of, you know, uh, experts or non-experts, you know, somebody sensitive, somebody that has opinions and somebody that's intelligent and then knows the difference. You know, they don't have to be a filmmaker. Right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, is there one film of yours that communicates your point of view more so than the others? I don't know. I think they all communicate a certain point of view, a different point of view. Each one of them has a different message, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so how do you deal with the perpetual problem of keeping afloat financially for a documentary filmmaker? Uh, it's very difficult. I mean, and it was more difficult after I got divorced. You know, I had to, like, at one point I had to mortgage my house to finish a film and not know if I was going to make enough money to actually pay for it. But um, I have been very fortunate in getting grants for most of these films. And also I've taught, you know, and I spoke, you know, to uh, students all over the world, really, for money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you like uh, speaking to students and being in front of an audience like that? I like it. I, I like it a lot, especially if they know about my work and they have questions and they have, you know, suggestions or what have you. I love students. Students are the best audience. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> do you feel like the world, I mean, that it's financially harder now to make nonfiction films through the, the changes that have happened in the last, you know, 20 years? I think so. I mean, here in San Francisco, there used to be a community of filmmakers, you know, a very strong community. And uh, I think that that union of all of us together in this, you know, made it possible to go forward. And somehow it has disintegrated. Only, I mean, some of us are older and we're no longer, we don't have the energy that we did when we were younger. You know, so, you know, that we don't have the same ties anymore or share the same films. And, uh, 
Yeah, I, I, filmmaking has changed radically. It's not it's not a community oriented endeavor anymore. In some way, you know what I'm saying. It's more kind of all over the place, and there's many types of documentaries, and uh, some better than others. But I think it's suffered. Mm. You know, I think you know documentary filmmaking has really suffered. And uh, only some of us get to make them. And people that should be making them, you know, are not getting the support to make them. Yeah. And that's something we should think about. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the younger ones are the future. Right. We're the past. What would you say to a young documentary filmmaker starting out now? What kind of advice would you give them? I just would say be bold. Don't be afraid, you know, and you don't need so much money anymore, and you can make it, you know? That's what I tell them. But just be bold. Don't make the same old documentary. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit about um, how your um, dyslexia may have influenced your creative path. A little bit because I think that that could be kind of inspiring to a lot of people yeah um, who have yeah who have dyslexia and maybe don't know it or do know it and yeah you know well I think um, yeah you know with dyslexia you find out sooner or later that I for me you know and for other people that uh, the language that is most easily accessible to one is visual you know and um, you pursue that, and you feel empowered because, in a way, everything that you couldn't put into the things that you can't do, you put into this artistic world. And it's very gratifying when you see that you can, that there's a facility, finally you can, you know, move around and make something, make a statement, and, and do something meaningful. Is it empowering? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, when I found out that I could make art, I felt like, oh, I can relax for a second, you know? I, I don't have to struggle against all these odds of, you know, uh, words and numbers. Right. That's great. Thank you for sharing that piece of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what are some of your current projects. Are you working on anything right now? Yes, I'm working on a very sh short little film that um, I've always wanted to make a film about my dreams. So uh, I had a wonderful dream. I, I have been very sick for three years. You know, I had cancer and um, I had a dream that was, I mean, I'm not going to tell you the dream, but it made me feel, when I woke up, it made me feel like I was empowered to go on and that there was something that, that I was going to be healed because of my dream. Mm. And uh, I'm making a little animated film, just teeny, like probably a minute and a half of the dream. Wow. That it's very exalting at the end. And uh, my... Um, not my my nephew-in-law is the animator. Mm -hmm. He's a computer animator, so he's doing that. And uh, it, I feel like I'm so happy that I can do it because I'm talking about, you know, real hippie things. <laughs> totally, totally off the wall hippie stuff that I've always believed in and I love you know like light is life you know something like that almost you know spiritual it's it, it really and when you're very ill you realize all these things so I'm able to say those things and I and with this little one minute and a half little animation I'm going to say it well <laughs> but it's it's, it's a it's a documentary about my dream Oh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> when will it be done? <laughs> right. In a year. Yeah. It takes forever. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's particularly interesting that you said you're making a film about your dream because at some point when I was reading articles about your work and watching it, uh, it kept coming up that there's sort of a dreamlike quality to a lot of your work. It's very poetic, um, both visually and and um, in the narration or the voiceover. It's So those... To me, I see those qualities in your work already. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of a... Yeah. Well, you know, I think that a lot of artists see, like, a, a visual production as part of a dream life. You know, it's uh, all together. And uh, I see that very much, yeah. Yeah, and my dreams are very important to me. Extraordinarily important. Do you write them down? Yeah, I do, yeah. Cool. <laughs> 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 is um are there any places where you feel you see your work emulated my your work, work emulated uh sometimes i see it with some students you know yeah 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 that's sweet that's very flattering but you know they have their own dreams <laughs> definitely yeah so tell me uh, i want to talk a little bit about the academy okay um when did you become a member of the academy do you remember when did I become a member? You know, many years ago. I don't remember exactly. I couldn't tell yeah. you. Five, seven years ago, something like that. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And how has that been um, good for you as a filmmaker, as a person? Oh, no, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to get the recognition. It also, it's wonderful to be engaged with the Academy and different levels. You know, to be a part of, you know, what is driving a whole industry. And to, to have a voice, that's very important to me, to have a voice in the academy. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. Good. That's great. Have there been any academy events that have been particularly meaningful or significant? Oh, you? yes. We had an event, I think, in, in 2010, at, uh, in, in Los Angeles, it was a panel of uh, documentarians, and we had a conversation that was, I thought was really wonderful. Do you feel like the, the, the documentary genre has become better represented within the Academy? I think there's an attempt to better represent documentarians. I think that documentarians still are marginalized, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, more things can be done, but I, I, I see that they're doing more things, so it's very encouraging. Are there any particular things that you would suggest that could be done to, like, I don't know, I'm just curious. Yeah, that, no, you know? yeah, no, no, I, I mean, I wouldn't know what to suggest. I mean, I'd have to study it a little bit. But, uh, I mean, I feel them reaching out, which is great. You know, that never happened before. Right. Good. Yeah. What do you see as the Academy's role in film preservation and, and restoration? Well, if the Academy doesn't save them, you know, doesn't save these films, I don't know who else really could afford to do it. I mean, I'm hoping, you know, that the Academy continues with film preservation and, and you know, film history. You know, it, it behooves them, really. I think so. What are you doing to preserve your own work? My own work, like I told you, is at uh, in New York uh, Museum of Modern Art, which is great. And some of it is at, uh, at UC Berkeley, you know, and uh, all my papers and all my films are also at uh, Stanford, your alma mater. Yay. <laughs> your <laughs> special collections. Good, that's great. Yeah. Cool. Um, how, how would you like to see documentary filmmaking represented in the new Academy Museum? I could only say in a big way. <laughs> in a really big way. Because a documentary, you know, is not only an art, but it's a historical piece, you know? And I think it would be, like, rightfully represented if it went almost hand in hand with fiction. Mm -hmm. Great. What would you say are the greatest lessons you've learned in your career so far? 
honey, if I told you the truth. <laughs> Tell me the truth. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> the greatest lessons I learned in my, in my career. You see, I've never thought of this. I have to ruminate. Okay. That's okay. I have more questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, if you had to pick one thing, what would you describe as your proudest achievement so far? That's, you're asking very hard things. I know. You know, you know already. <laughs> um, achievements in my field, in my work. Uh, I think I'm just really happy that I've made the films that I've made, you know, because it, uh, it illuminates the life of people such as myself. I'm happy that I have made subjective films and that I have followed my instincts because it's part of the historical presence of Mexican people, Latino people, people of color in this country. And that the more we have of that, the better. That's what makes me proud and happy. And I hope that young, you know, filmmakers do the same thing. Because we have to see ourselves in film. We have to see ourselves in documentary. We have to see ourselves everywhere the way we are. You know, we are everywhere. So we should all be together, you know, representing, as the teenagers say. Yeah, <laughs> they do say that. Um, what have been the most difficult or challenging times in your career? Probably, um, probably juggling between family and work. Yep. Yes, that's the most difficult thing. Yeah. Yeah. What are your hopes for the future of the documentary film? Um. I just hope that it keeps on going, that it keeps on searching for the truth, that it, that it be creative, you know, engaging, and, uh, and touching. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like your aspirations as a filmmaker have changed much over the years? No, they've become more acute, I think, yeah. yeah. Is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew when you were first starting out? Oh, yeah, a lot. But I couldn't even, we couldn't even start. <laughs> you know, it's everything, right? It's when you're young. I mean, you're full of hope and dreams and, you know. Yep. And then when you're old, you're full of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you have any idea what you would be doing if you weren't a documentarian? A veterinarian? You know, no, <laughs> because, you know, I decided to be a filmmaker when I was like 21 years old. I, I don't think I could do anything else. I think I'd be really bad at anything else. Great. <laughs> I think uh, probably the greatest lessons that I've ever learned is to be kinder. Mm. I'm kind of a ruffian. Really? Yeah. 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 To be kinder, to be more compassionate, and to listen carefully. Those are the greatest lessons. <laughs> Those are good ones. That's surprising because of the types of films you make which seemed to me to have a tremendous amount of compassion. I do have compassion, but I'm careless sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, 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 uh, I come from the north of Mexico, where Pancho Villa comes from. So we have a manner about us, right, that's very direct and very um, um, not uh, elegant. <laughs> So I think that's what I mean by it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Was there anything else you'd like to talk about that we missed? I just want to tell you how I feel about The Devil Never Sleeps and the voice of Ophelia, that it haunts me. Really? Yeah, it haunts me that I never could get, you know, her to uh, give me a release and that I had to go through all that. And that that is one of the things that, for me, is so hard about not only the devil, but documentary filmmaking, and I feel like it's like a, a failure of mine. Mm. It's, it's interesting. And when I speak sometimes to students, like for example with John Ells at the School of Journalism in Berkeley, I mean, we talk about this a lot, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so that's it. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>